I hate theater. Well, it's so disappointing, isn't it? You know what I do when I'm sitting in a darkened theater waiting for a show to begin? I pray. Oh, please, God, let it be a good show. And let it be short. Dear Lord in heaven, let it be short. Two hours is fine. Three hours is too much. And keep the actors out of the audience. God, I did not pay good money to have the fourth wall come crashing down around my ears. I just want a story. And a few good songs that'll take me away. I just want to be entertained. I mean, isn't that the point? Amen. You know, there was a time when people sat in darkened theaters and thought to themselves, what if George and Ira Gershwin got for us tonight? Or can Cole Porter pull it off again? Can you believe it? Now it's more like, please, Elton John, must we continue this charade? <laughs> it, it used to be sitting there in the dark, you knew that when the show began, you would be taken to a whole other world. And <laughs> you thought to yourself, my God, when are they gonna bring up the lights? Oh, how things have changed. <laughs> how are we doing tonight? We good? Someone give me something. You, sir, how are you doing tonight? Anyone? Good? Good? Good. There we go. You can talk. Congratulations. I'm feeling a little blue myself. You know, a little sad for no particular reason. A little self-conscious that I might be feeling sad at this age. I don't know. A, a little non-particular sadness resulting in self-conscious anxiety. A feeling that I like to call blue. So when I'm feeling this way, blue, I, I like to listen to my music. So I was digging through my records. Yes, records. And I was about to put on Meredith Wilson's The Music Man. I had a craving for a young Ronnie Howard. But then I thought, no, let's have a treat. Let's get lost in the decadent world of the 1920s, when the champagne flowed while the caviar chilled and all the world was a party, for the wealthy anyway. So I dug about, and what did I find but one of my favorite shows of all time, Gable and Stein's The Drowsy Chaperone. You know the one, right? Music by Julie Gable, lyrics by Sidney Stein. It's a two-record set, remastered from the original Broadway cast recording, including Beatrice Stockwell as the chaperone. Isn't she elegant? And remember, this is a full 15 years before she was Dame Beatrice Stockwell. Let me read you what it says in the back. Mix-ups, mayhem, and a gay wedding. Of course, gay wedding has a totally different meaning now, but back then it just meant fun. And that's exactly what this show is. It's fun. So, will you guys let me put on the record. Will you indulge me, please? I was hoping you'd say yes. You hear that sound? Stat. I love that sound. To me, it's the sound of a time machine starting. All right, now let's visualize. Imagine, if you will, it's November 1928. You've just arrived at the doors of the Morosco Theater in New York. It's very cold. Remember when it used to be cold in November? Not anymore. November's the new August now. It's global warming. We're all doomed. Anyway, it's very cold. And a grace lead is falling from the sky, but you don't care because you're on your way to see a Broadway show. All right, listen carefully. Isn't this wonderful? It helps if you close your eyes. Overtures. Overtures are out of style now. I miss them. It's the show's way of welcoming you. Hello, the meal will be served shortly, but in the meantime, would you like an appetizer? That's really what an overture is. A musical appetizer. A poo-poo platter of tunes, if you will. <laughs> ah. Wait a moment. Don't worry, there's no pirates. Okay, now here it comes. The moment, the crucial moment, where the music starts to build, and you know you're only seconds away from being transported. Oh, I can see it on your faces. You guys are excited. <laughs>
The curtain's about to go up. I can't wait. It's a miracle, madam. My dress, my dress, my fancy dress. I don't know why I'm wearing it, I must confess. My dress, my dress, I love my dress. Would someone tell me why I put it on? Yes, yes, your dress, your fancy dress. It was such a pleasure airing it, restitching and preparing it. God bless, your dress is one fine dress. And I will tell you why you put it on. Wedding bells will ring, wedding bells will chime. Madam, you're the first to send it's happy wedding time. Wedding bells will ding. This whole wedding's gonna run like clockwork. No, oh, is there gonna be a wedding? I'm Felton, producer.
and we will ding a ling along. I don't even know what that means. All right, I'm gonna lead you through this record as best I can. Don't worry, it won't be too hard to follow. So we begin with a welcome from the Love Struck Room. Well, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. I tell you, I must be some lucky fellow. Why, who would have thought that I, Robert Martin, would be marrying a glamour showgirl, and that glamour showgirl would be willing to give up a successful career for me. Robert Martin. Now, if it weren't for prohibition, I'd say let's raise a glass. Here, here. To Miss Janet Van de Graaff, the most beautiful girl in the world. Absolutely not. Excuse me? <clears throat> the groom mustn't see his bride on the day of his wedding. It's bad luck. I hope you heard that, because that's the plot. Basically. Hang on for the ride. <laughs> Breakfast will be served in the Arabian room. <laughs> say, it's a little early in the day to be drinking, isn't it? I don't understand the question. <laughs> Look, you just keep Janet away from Robert, okay? You are the chaperone. That is your only job. I am, oh, Capitan. Oh, Robert, who's my little monkey? I am. I'm your little monkey. <laughs> so the bride and the groom are whisked away, and we turn our attention to the B-plot, which involves the producer. Getting married and leaving show business. Mr. Feltzig. Doesn't she know I got obligations? Mr. Feltzig. I can be your leading lady. You said it yourself. I'm useless in the chorus. Kitty, how many times have I got to tell you? You ain't got what it takes. But I've been taking lessons. Singing, acting, ballet. Ballet? Yeah, I'm pretty good, too. Last week, I auditioned for Swanee Lake. A little annotation here. Kitty and Felsig were a couple in real life. Jack and Sadie Adler. Now, here's a familiar comic construct. A stupid woman and her long-suffering companion. Well, she appears stupid. But in the end, she does something very clever and it makes everyone wonder whether it was all just an act. The irony here is that, well, Sadie was actually quite stupid. Jack had to explain all the jokes to her, apparently. Still, she had a wonderful career on stage. Back then, the theater was the only place where stupid people could make a decent living. <laughs> this is before television, of course. Kitty, I don't have time for this. A petite four, Mr. Feltzig? Not oh, now. Perhaps a nice profitable. Boys, I'm not hungry. Then perhaps we could give you something else to chew on. Yeah, something that ain't food. What? Your confusion is to be expected. Although we stand here before you in the guise of innocent pastry chefs, we are also, and primarily, employees of a certain individual. A certain individual. A certain individual who happens to be the largest single investor in Feltzig's Follies. He has sent us here as pastry chefs to express his concerns about Miss Van de Graaff's impending nuptials. Specifically, that if she gets married and leaves the show, then there ain't no show. Say, don't I know you? No, you don't. Have you ever spent any time in Toledo? Have you ever spent any time in Oklahoma? Um, no, but I have a cousin in Seattle. Kitty, boys, <laughs> you tell your boss the wedding is never going to happen. You have my word. Well, we'll take your word all right. But to go back on that word would be a recipe for disaster. And we hope we have made ourselves perfectly eclair. One can only hope. You biscotti be kidding me. A trifle much. Don't talk with me. Boys, you can drop the pastry chef routine. Alas, we cannot. We're on the lamb. Lamb's an entree, macaroon. The gangsters were played by the interchangeable vaudeville duo, the Tall Brothers. Now, they were born Abram and Mandel Mazlaskowitz, but they were renamed at Ellis Island by a sarcastic immigration official. They were an early example of the typical Broadway gangster, full of stylized movements, wordplay, not very intimidating. Unless you find dancers intimidating, which I do, but for reasons that would not be appropriate to this situation. <laughs> we'll leave the matter in your hands, Mr. Feltzig, but for now, try something off the dessert carousel. <laughs> yeah, try the Toledo Surprise. It's to die for. <gasps> Holy cats! Mr. Feltzig! They're gangsters! Very perceptive. Now go powder your face. <laughs> I've got to stop this wedding, but how? Oh, Lord in heaven, how? How? <laughs> I always thought that moment was a little overplayed. So, with the story well on its way, we go to the groom's room. <laughs> The groom was played by the dashing Percy Hyman. He started out as the Albright toothpaste man. His fabulous smile adorned every two. Albright was hugely popular in the early 20s because it contained cocaine. It, it's true, if you looked at the label, it was the fifth ingredient down, right after sugar. Anyway, it wasn't long before he became a huge matinee idol. Now don't you worry, it's perfectly normal for a groom to be nervous on his wedding day. It is, 
Of course. <laughs> now, some people say that Percy Hyman was a terrible actor, but to those people, I say, shut up. <laughs> hey there, Mr. Mirror Man. Shaking and awaken. Traveling like Deborah. Cold beats, brother, you got cold beats. You can make them cold beats hot with the little rhythm. Young beats, old beats can be uncontrollable beats. Rhythm make them cold beats trot down the aisle. Frosty arches, they can learn to swing. Icy toes can jump. Percy Hyman was a wonderful performer. I like to think of him panting and sweating after a long dance routine. He's still alive, you know. I recently saw him on TV celebrating his 100th birthday. To say that the passing years had taken their toll on him would be a grotesque understatement. They wheeled him out, and he had that expression on his face of pain, confusion. You know the one that says, Bruh, who are you? Who am I? And why is this cake on fire? You guys know the one I'm talking about, right? Anyway. All right, all right. That's enough of that. Dancing around like a fool. Sorry, George. I was just trying to calm my nerves. It is my wedding day, after all. 
Well, you could have snapped an ankle. Dancing is way too dangerous. I have an idea. Why don't you just go out for a skate instead? <laughs> That's what I do when I want to blow off some steam. George, what would I do without you? Oh, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. What was I thinking? Oh, you're not going out like that, my friend. You might see Janet. Here, take this blindfold. <laughs> George, you think of everything. Just looking out for you, my boy. And no more dancing. <laughs> Wedding bells will ring. Wedding bells will chime. Wedding bells will celebrate. Just, just ignore it. It does this occasionally. It, it rings. It'll stop. What? What do you want? Hello. I can't come to the phone right now, but if you leave a message, I guess I'll get back to you at my earliest convenience. That's it, the moment is ruined. Thank you, thank you, life! It's like a cell phone going off in a theater. Oh, I hate that. Oh, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just at the theater ruining the moment. How about you? Oh, oh, oh I couldn't get out tonight, so I thought I'd ruin the moment by proxy. <laughs> let's, uh, let's just put that behind us. Let's go back in our minds to 1928. They didn't have cell phones in 1928. But I'm sure they had something for the ruining of moments. Bugles or something. Happy wedding time! So, the scene shifts, and we find the bride, the glamorous Miss Janet Vandegraaff. And in this scene, she's entertaining questions from reporters as she lounges by the pool. Is it true that you're giving up a successful career to marry a man you hardly know? Yes. Robert and I met on the Lido deck of the Ile de France. He amused me with stories of his father's oil interests. We spooned, briefly, and then he proposed. And you'll never be returning to the stage ever? I shan't. You shan't? I shan't. Are you on that? Of course. One more question. Yes? Why would anyone put olives in a Gibson? I have a question. How can you give up the footlights when you know you've got grease paint in your veins? Victor, please. Janet, I'm begging you. Dump the log. Stay with the follies. I'll give you anything you want. Anything. I'll, I'll, oh, fine. I'll put your name above mine on the marquee. Oh, Victor, if you think this is about vanity, you couldn't be more wrong. I don't want to show off no more. I don't want to sing tunes no more. I don't want to ride moons no more. I don't want to show off. I don't want to wear this no more. Play the saucy Swiss Miss no more. Below my signature no more.
Jane Roberts is the bride. She was the oops girl, remember? Surely you remember the oops girl. Don't you people ever read? She was billed as the girl whose sexual energy was so great that it caused the men around her to have accidents. Spill their drinks, drive their cars in the trees, that kind of stuff. And she would go, oops! <laughs> well, I'm not really selling it right now, but people ate it up. There was a whole series of films made. Oops, The Oops Girl, Oops Girl Come Home, and Oops Girl at Sea, which won an Oscar for special effects. All right, so begging and groveling didn't work on the plan B, and for that I'm going to need an accomplice. Someone gullible with loose morals. I need a, what do you call them? A European. La 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 la. In walks Aldolfo, self-proclaimed ladies man. Aldolfo was played by former silent film star and world-class alcoholic Roman Bartel. He was the one who later drank himself to death at his chateau in Nice, remember? Oh, it, it was four days before they found the body, and by that time it had been partially consumed by his poodles. It was only partially consumed. Excuse me, I don't believe we've met. Yes, I am Aldolfo. You are Aldolfo? Yes, I am Aldolfo. Not the Aldolfo. Yes, I am Aldolfo. <laughs> Funny, you don't look like a scoundrel. Ah, uh, yes, it what? Why, just now I overheard the groom saying Aldolfo was a scoundrel. I just heard him say that. What? Aldolfo is a scoundrel. Those very words. Aldolfo is a scoundrel. Like a oh, again. no, this is outrageous. He's telling this to people so the beautiful ladies with press for making love. Why, I must. I must. You must. You must take matters into your own hands. Ah, yes, I must take this groom into my hands. And kill him. Yes. No. <laughs> Don't kill him. Just hurt him enough so that he can't get married. Yes. Okay. Show me to the screw. Uh, wait. What? What kind of man is the screw? See how big man? Wow. See how burly man? Oh, he's big on the outside. No, 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 no. A doubtful and that's fight. Big man. Only small, pale, wheezy little dwarf people that a doubtful can punch for. <laughs> but no big man. So you're a lover, not a fighter. Ah, yes, Adolfo was a lover of beautiful ladies. Some call me the king of romance. Well, you know what they say, the best way to get revenge on a man is through a... Door! No. The uh, best way to get back at a man is through a... Window! No. <laughs> revenge, back at a man through a... Is... Oh, I don't know the ways of that Santa Claus coming down chimney. Through his woman! Ah, uh, through his woman! He must seduce his woman! His bride! His bride! Adolfo will make love to the bride. That will show people Adolfo is no scoundrel. Show me to this bride. Hey, wait, what? What kind of woman is this bride? <laughs> she a big woman. She a burly woman. She a cat pajamas. She's a looker, an attractive woman. A doubtful will make love to this cat in pajama. A doubtful will make a brrrr. Stop it. Like a cat in pajama. <laughs> Roman Bartelli chewing the scenery. You certainly couldn't get away with a performance like that nowadays. Mature contemporary audiences are too sophisticated to enjoy broad racial stereotypes. So we banished him to Disney. 
Let the children sort it out, right? Underling? Yes, madam? The pastry chefs have been kind enough to provide the liquor for the party, but remember, underling, we have to be discreet. Yes, madam? It is prohibition after all. I understand, madam. We don't have to use code words. For instance, if someone asks for a glass of ice water, it really means they want a glass of vodka. Have you got that? Yes, madam. Are you sure? Maybe you should write it down. I understand, madam. A glass of ice water is a glass of vodka. What's a glass of ice water? Vodka. Ice water? Vodka. Ice water? Vodka. Vodka. <laughs> well, you see, that's settled then. One less thing to do. Now, underling, yes. might I please have a glass of ice water? I found our meeting with the pastry chefs rather trying, and I would enjoy a nice glass of ice water. Your ice water? That was your vodka, you poop! I hate this scene. Well, now I really do need a glass of ice water. A glass of ice water? Yes, a glass of ice water. Are you going deaf? Would that I were. You can see where this is going, can't you? It's really just a series of spit takes. Your ice water. That was your body, you You know, in some ways, the drowsy chaperone was quite progressive. A black actress playing the aviatrix, for instance. Your ice water. Yes, some elements were progressive, others were stale in 1928. You know what, I'm just gonna skip ahead here. Your eyes lost him. That was... that... Poop? Where do you think you're going? To get some lime juice, madam. Lime juice? For heaven's sake, why? I'm going to wring out my eyebrows and make myself a gimlet. <laughs> Now, you're probably asking yourself, what was that scene doing in the show? Well, it's very simple. There's a song coming up, and they needed something to allow for a set change. It's mechanics. It's like pornography. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. In pornography, the story is simplistic. How am I going to pay for this pizza, being the classic example? <sighs> My point is... As in a musical, the story only exists to connect to the longer, more engaging production numbers. What? Well, what kind of a society do you live in if we can't compare the similarities between musical theater and pornography? In a few hours, I'm going to be Mrs. Robert Martin. Yes, life's mad, whirlwind. This is a really interesting scene. This is the only scene in the entire show where Jane Roberts and Beatrice Stockwell are alone on stage together. Jane Roberts was an emerging star, but Beatrice Stockwell was already well established and a force to contend with. I'm so full of apprehension. I suppose that's normal considering the circumstances. Have you ever been married, chaperone? No, I drink for pleasure, not out of necessity. Yo, ice water, madam. I'm afraid we've shut up olives, however. Have you ever been married, Underling? Oh, heavens no. If I'm to serve a woman, I'd prefer to get paid for my efforts. Oh, you too? I know it seems crazy to give up a successful career to marry a man I hardly know, but somehow, for some reason, when I look into his eyes, his big monkey eyes, ah, gee, I get all woozy. And that's love, isn't it? Not necessarily. The wooziness can be caused by any number of things, I mean, and I'm feeling woozy right now, and I'm certainly not in love. Beatrice Stockwell was famous for her rousing anthems. She entertained and inspired the troops in every major world conflict, up to and including the Falklands War. Of course, by that time, she was in her late 80s, and her anthems didn't so much rouse as stupefy. Still, she demanded that a rousing anthem be put in every show she ever did, even when it wasn't appropriate. But you just couldn't say no to her. That's star power. Really? You're not being the least bit helpful. Couldn't you at least allay my fears with a few choice words of inspiration? <laughs> inspiration? Really, my dear, that's hardly my forte. Yes, but if you... As we stumble along On life's funny journey As we stumble along
Let me explain. Oh, no, no, it's not necessary. I suppose I'm just the... It's a dismal little world in which we live. It can bore you till you've nothing left to give. Seven overrated wonders, seven underwhelming seas, six excruciating continents, Antarctica, oh, please. Antarctica, oh, please. Still, you mustn't let it lick you, this planet, oh, so bland. Keep your eyeball on the highball in your head. As we stumble upon which your future happiness depends. Oh, thank you, Chaperon! I just have to know if he loves me! Such a skinny fool. Still, I envy her. Oh, when will love come crashing through my door? La 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 la! Look who it is! Adolfo, come to seduce the bride! I am Adolfo! Try not to think of the poodles during this scene. I am Adolfo. You are bride. No, I am not. What? But this is a bridal suite, and you're the only one here. Therefore, you must be bride. Interesting argument, but I'm afraid you're a moron. What? Me? No bride. Perhaps I could take a message. 
Yes, all right. Dear Van de Graaff Bride, I must make love to Joe and transport Joe to a place of ecstasy. <laughs> Sooner is better sign of Dumpo, King of Hornets. Well, you saw right through my little ruse. You found me out. Ah, so you are the bride. Apparently, yes. Take me out, Dolphin. No, 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 no. Not a Dolphin. A Dolphin. Oh, you must remember my name when we're making love and you're screaming. You must say the right name or it'll ruin everything. How can I make you remember? Myself, I am a Nice to meet you, shall we? Not so fast, so just in case you didn't hear our dad fall. I tried to make it very clear our dad fall. The lovely ladies always hear our dad fall. When I repeat myself, I am a dad fall. I can sing it high, oh, oh, oh. I can sing it low, our dad fall. I can sing it very fast. I can sing it very slowly. I do it now, but uh, that would take hours. <laughs> Not to see if you can remember my name. I'll give it a shot. Now, who's the fellow that you see? Aldolfo. And how should you refer to me? Aldolfo. And who is it that I'll always be? Aldolfo. Now sing it proudly. You are Aldolfo. Now let me spell it out for sure. For lush and lovely ladies out there are not here for some reason. <laughs> Maybe you are hard of hearing or something, I don't know. Ah, ah, ha, ha. swept off her feet by a Latin lover. I mean a real Latin lover, not a buffoon. <laughs> then again, I guess that's what everyone loves about musicals, right? Romantic fantasy, falling in love at the drop of a hat, spontaneous tangoing, suddenly finding yourself in an insanely romantic setting. so I have to wear a blindfold. A blindfold? I'm sorry, who am I speaking to anyhow? Why, it's me! I mean, it's Mimi. Mimi from France. The scene couldn't be more ridiculous. <laughs> so, you are marrying Janet Vandegraaff, no? We? Oui. I hear she's very beautiful. We. Oui. And glamorous. Ah, oh, we, oui, we. Oui. Is it true that she has an exceptionally broad range and excels at playing both comedic and dramatic roles? Say, I'm having trouble placing your accent. What part of France are you from? Oh, the middle part, where they make toast. <laughs> so, you are telling me about your, how do you say it in English, fiancé? That's right. Well, tell me, when was the moment you knew she was the only one for you? Well, it's a funny story, actually. 
We were standing on the Lido deck of the Ile de France. Yes. And I was amusing her with stories of my father's oil interests. And then what happened? And then I looked into her eyes, her big, glamorous eyes, and I felt all woozy. <laughs> and then you fell. Uh, and then you fell? Yes, right on my Easter. And I said, well, I guess I don't have my sea legs yet. But we haven't left the dock. That's what she said. And that's what I knew of must be love. And then what happened? And then I said, there was a time I could stop on a dime. Forbearance was one of my talents. But since you've been around, I can't hold my ground. I'm consistently losing my balance. I'm an accident waiting to happen. I'm a mishap about to ensue. I'm the toy on the stair, the three-legged chair, the hem that's been caught by a shoe. When my two lovesick arms started flapping, there was nothing my ankles could do. I'm an accident waiting to happen, so happy I happen to you. And then what happened? And then she joined in. say I'm sweet and they fall at my feet. My heart doesn't beat any faster. But when you lose control, it touches my soul. So I'm bracing myself for disaster. You're an accident waiting to happen. A catastrophe destined to be. That's me. I'm the race in the cell. Mush it up, throw it in, 
That's a taste of Toledo, Toledo surprise. First you beat it up, then you sweet it up. When you heat it up, if it tries to rise, don't let it, it's a snap. Try it, folks, with your whites, split your yolks. Then you got a Splendido, Toledo surprise. Huh? Keep it up, I'll go work on the contract. Hey, hey! I'm five, six, seven, eight! This is fast, eh? What's going on here? Oh. Hey, I'm developing a new act. Toledo surprise! You mean you're putting gangsters in the show when you won't put me in? They're not even in the union. No, you got it all wrong. The new act is for you, kitty! And these boys are their backup dancers! <gasps> backup dancers? Time for the intermission. Or at least it would be if we were actually sitting in the Morosco Theater, which obviously we are not. I don't like intermissions. They ruin the magic. You know, I mean, one minute you're lost in a glamorous world of color, and then, and then boom, you're in a lobby surrounded by tourists, crinkling candy wrappers, and 
complaining about the lack of women's restrooms. It's cruel. <laughs> it's a power bar. I have a bit of a blood sugar issue. I have to eat small meals all day long or I get all jittery. I know it's not very polite, but you would not like the alternative. Believe you me. Believe you me. <laughs> I remember my wedding day. I missed breakfast and the ceremony wasn't until four in the afternoon. Ah, I do, I do! Oh, I see how it is. You're surprised that I was married. Well, there you go. You shouldn't go making assumptions about people. I'm a very complicated person. I have to pee now. I'll be quick, I promise. And in the meantime, you can listen to the beginning of Act Two. That song is not from the Jersey Chaperone. <laughs> That's from another musical entirely. <sighs> I have a woman who comes in once a month. Can you say that? I have a woman? <laughs> anyway, uh, she cleans the things that I absolutely refuse to. But she has this terrible habit of putting my records away and in the wrong sleeves. Even though I tell her, no touch records, Carmela. No touch records. <laughs> I suppose if I spoke to her in complete sentences, she might actually stop touching them. <laughs> that song opens up act two of another Gable and Stein show, The Enchanted Nightingale, a degrading piece of chinoiserie about a Chinese emperor who's told by a magical bird to marry his American elocutionist instead of his betrothed, and he ends up building the Great Wall of China. A slap to the face to 4,000 years of Chinese history. But it has some great tunes. <laughs> Including that one, which features Beatrice Stockwell as American Lady and Roman Bartelli as the Emperor. You see, he was a man of a thousand accents, all of them offensive. <laughs> Act two of The Drowsy Chaperone begins with this. A haunting lament from a very depressed bride. She sings it standing on her balcony, bathed in the pale blue light of a sympathetic moon. Which is ridiculous because it's the middle of the day. Now, when you're listening to this part, just try to ignore the lyrics. I know it won't be easy, but just try to block them out. They're not the best. But the tune is beautiful. It really communicates the bride's state of mind. Just please try to ignore the lyrics. I put a monkey on a pedestal And tried to make that monkey stay I need 
to be so gloomy? No, no, no. no. I don't the world so I chose. Sigmund Freud says flowers to me every show. Gertrude Stein, she handed me a rose. I'm Janet, Janet Van de Graaff. Ain't no nail that I can't hammer. Why give up a life of glamour? Life of glamour? Life of glamour? No! I just love that number. <laughs> it has everything. A little Busby Berkeley, a little Jane Goodall. <laughs> and that's another thing I love about musicals in general. When a character's in crisis, they sing and they dance, which is so much more interesting than just whining about it. This is what I'm talking about. This is life. You manage to be happy for five seconds and then something starts breaking. A beautiful day for a wedding. Shall I have the pews removed now, or would you prefer I wait until morning? Okay, I'm gonna stop here, because I don't want this number ruined by any ringing telephones. Here we have two vaudeville performers who have slipped through the cracks of time. Noel Fitzpatrick and Ukulele Lil. I don't know anything about them. I, I suppose Ukulele Lil played the ukulele, although she doesn't in this show. I tried to find out more about them. I went through all my books. I even tried the internet, but all my searches ended with Tiny Tim's autopsy photographs. <laughs> Still, they're both charming. But why would you have the pews removed? Well, the, the bride is called up the wedding, madam. Oh, underling, never listen to a bride on her wedding day. Love's a very complex motion, underling. Yes, madam. One minute you can be totally in love with someone, and the next, why well, you just want to strangle them! Do you understand? Yes, I'm familiar with the urge to strangle. <laughs> That's just the nature of love. Love makes lovers worry, love makes lovers fret, but here's a fact on which we can depend. Just like long ago when Romeo loved Juliet, love is always lovely in the end. Might I remind you, madam, that Romeo and Juliet was a tragedy? Oh, I never read reviews. Love can start a quarrel, love can cause a din, but love has always been a trusty friend. Twas a happy fate for Hank the Eight and Anne Boleyn. Love is always lovely in the end. Madam, Anne Boleyn lost her head. Yes, because she was in love. Love was good for Eve and Adam. Well, here we go again. And Samson and Delilah too. Good grief, may I pose a question, madam? Why 
yes, of course. Why does nothing I say to you ever get through? Don't mind if I do. But to be frank, on some level that number pisses me off. <laughs> now I'm gonna say something here, and yes, I have been drinking, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that love is not always lovely in the end. <laughs> Often in the end, there are lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just thought that needed to be said for the benefit of the young people. <laughs> I'm not gonna interrupt anymore. There's a moment coming up that I've become obsessed with. There you are! Oh, chaperone, I'm in a terrible state! You certainly are. You can't go to the wedding dressed like that. Oh, you poor dear, haven't you heard? The wedding's been called off. Not your wedding, mine. Well, that reminds me, might I borrow your veil? You're getting married? But to whom? La 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 la! Beautiful lady with baffled expression. You're marrying Adolfo? I know it's surprising, but when I look into his eyes, his big, clumsy eyes, I get all drowsy. And that's love, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, dear, that is love. Help me. <laughs> oh, there you are. All right, I'm putting all my cards on the table. I got a weak heart. It can't take the pressure. If this goes on any longer, the old ticker's gonna give out. So please, tell me, is there going to be a way or not? Yes. Oh, thank the good Lord in heaven. Adolfo and the chaperone are getting married. What? There you are. I have the wonderful news. There's going to be a wedding. Oh, yes, we know. You know, but who told you? I did. But how did you know? What difference does it make? Mrs. Tottendale and I are to be married in the garden this evening at 7.30. What? What? Oh. Congratulations <laughs> to everyone. Say, what kind of cockamamie wedding is this? Everyone's getting married except for the bride and groom. Oh, Janet, I've been looking everywhere for you. Hello, Mr. Martin. Janet, please don't be that way. Can't you find it in your heart to marry me? It's our wedding day. George has gone to all this trouble, and I do love you more than I can say. But you kissed another woman. I know, and I just can't understand it. But when I was kissing that French girl, I was just like kissing you. Oh, Robert, you were kissing me. You mean you're me, me? Well, that French accent was remarkably accurate. <laughs> Why, thank you. I developed it while playing Monique and hold that baguette. There you are! Before yeah. you do anything, think of this. No matter how well you play the role of happy bride, you will never, ever get a standing ovation. Oh, I just don't know. Oh, I'm so confused. Oh, chaperone, just this once, give me a piece of advice that is appropriate and coherent to the situation. Should I marry Robert? Okay, this is the moment I was talking about. Not only the culmination of the plot, but a moment that has fascinated me more than anything else, and that has brought me back to this record again and again. Here it is. Well, my advice to you is... This is it. Listen. Well, you can. You see? You can't quite make out what you're saying because someone drops a cane. I'll play for you again. While you can. Is she saying live while you can or leave while you can? While you can. <laughs> It's, it's Beatrice Stockwell, so it might just be a cynical quip. But this is a wedding after all, and that's what you think when you're standing there at the altar. Live or leave. And you have to live, because you do love her in some way. It's not an exact science. An arrow doesn't come out of the sky and point to the one you're supposed to be with. So one day you say to someone, you say, I love you. And you basically phrase it as a question, but they accept it as a fact. And then suddenly, 
There she is, standing in front of you in a $3,000 dress with tears in her eyes. And her nephew made the chuppah. So what do you say? You say, never mind, I was just kidding, I was only joking. No, you can't. You live. And for the next three months, you stare at the alien form in bed beside you, and you think, who are you? Who are you? And then one day, you say it out loud. And it's trial separation. And couples therapy, and all your conversations are about her eating disorder, and your Zoloft addiction, and you're constantly redefining, and reevaluating, and revisiting. And then you finally lose the deposit on the house. And the whole relationship ends on a particularly ugly note with your only copy of Gypsy soaring through the air and smashing against the living room wall. <laughs> but still, in a larger sense, in a broader sense, it's better to have lived than left, right? Why you can. You have no idea how many times I've listened to that. <laughs> Chaperone, you certainly have a way with words. Robert, my answer is yes. I will marry you. Right. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Mr. Feltzig, it looks like this wedding is a done deal. Now you're in truffle, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> there is. I found an alien lady. Presenting Kitty and Grandma. Ah. All right, Kitty. Now, come, concentrate. Show them how you can read my mind. My mind. Kitty, will you marry me? Oh, holy cats! Yes, Mr. Felty, yes! Isn't she amazing? Hey. Hey. Well, what are you girls waiting for? You go put your frillies on and we'll all get married in one big clump. That's how they do it in Utah! <laughs> well, George, I don't know how you managed to pull that off. Four weddings in one day? I guess you're everyone's best man now. I am? Yes, of course! I am. Hip hip. Hooray! He's George, that's George, the best man, George. I'm honored to be doing what a best man are. He's basking in the glory of a fight well fought. Wedding bells will ring, wedding bells will chime.
calm. This happens all the time. It's a horrible old apartment with terrible wiring. Look, everybody, stay calm. Just uh, try to keep the show alive in your minds. Don't let yourselves get distracted. Uh, don't talk to each other. Don't talk to each other. Put your phone away. Okay, everybody stay calm. I'm gonna try to find the fuse box. Be quiet. It's the super. Oh my God. Hi. Hello. Your lights are out. Yes. Yeah. We have to turn the power off because we're replacing the breaker panel in the basement. Yes. So we replaced it, but when we turn the power off, the fuse is in all the apartments stripped. That's what happens. It's normal. Yes. So I gotta reset your breakers. Right now? I'll only take a second. All right, all right, all right. Because I tried calling you earlier, but there was no answer. Oh yeah, I've been having some trouble with the phone. Here we go. It was a record. What kind of music was that? Uh, it was just music from a, a show, from a musical. You like musicals? No. I love musicals. <laughs> Go with the wife all the time. It is amazing what they can do nowadays. You see, Miss Saigon? They landed a helicopter on the stage in that one. <laughs> yeah, I've seen them all. Cats. Play Miss, Saturday Night Fever. Do I like the movie better? <laughs> really? Well, goodbye. <laughs> well, that's it. The moment is ruined. One note away from the end of the show and the mood is broken. I should just start it from the beginning. No, I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> Frustrating. You need to understand, I love this show so much and I've never even seen it. My mother bought me the record. This was right before my father left. He didn't leave because of the record. <laughs> Although I'm sure it didn't help matters much. Look, I, I know it's not the perfect show, okay? The spit take scene is lame, the monkey motif is labored, but none of that matters. It does what a musical is supposed to do. It takes you to another world and it gives you a little tune to carry with you in your head. A little something to help you escape from those dreary horrors of the real world. A little something for when you're feeling blue, you know? As we stumble along on life's funny journey, as we stumble along into the blue, we look here and we look there, seeking answers anywhere. Never sure of where to turn or what to do. And waiting to a past We bumble our way through life's crazy web. Bells will ring, wedding bells will chime. So we don't surprise.
bleach, peel the skin, mush it up, throw it in. That's the taste of Toledo. Toledo surprise. First you feed it up, then you sweet it up. When you heat it up, if it tries to rise, don't let it. It's a snap. Try it, folks. With your whites, split your yolks. Then you got a splendido. Toledo surprise. You boys are naturals. Us? Keep it up. I'll go work on the contract. Hey, hey. A five, six, seven, eight.